welcome. Thank you for uh, letting me uh, have a chance to speak to you guys. Uh, so, you know, as Pam said, I'm in the mechanical engineering department. What I study is nanotechnology on a very basic level. And, you know, I didn't have a very traditional path to, to getting to this position. You know, my, my degrees are actually in physics, and I did a lot of uh, uh, physics, you know, in undergraduate and graduate school, I did physics as my major. But, you know, nanotechnology is such an interdisciplinary subject that it doesn't matter that much where historically where you come from, that, you know, things that are, it, it, there is no nanotechnology department. And as a result, you know, different schools tend to put it into different places and in different programs. And so, you know, there's a lot of lateral motion between departments when in this subject. Um, and, you know, even uh, more pre previous to that, I also had a pretty non-traditional path in getting into, into academia. You know, I, I didn't, uh, you know, I, it, rather than just doing like four-year college, I actually did a uh, community college for my first couple of years. And, you know, and I didn't go, I went to just the university that was near my house. It wasn't a particularly special one. Uh, and then, but, you know, I was doing well enough that over time things I just sort of kept percolating up and I, and I just started going to more and more uh, prestigious places. So, you know, I really walked up from the, from uh, uh, just a very average place to get to where I am right now. All right. So, you know, let me talk about a little bit of the stuff that we do, you know, because the research that we're going to do uh, is very strongly tied to the MERSEC program, which means it's very strongly tied to a few of you guys' projects. So let me see if I can give you some background in this area. All right. So, you know, the first thing I think people need to know about nanotechnology is the rules are different. If you think about stuff that happens on the human scale, we typically call that continuum mechanics. That continuum mechanics is what all of you learned in your intro physics courses. And it says, if you take something and you cut it in half, then you're gonna get two objects with exactly the same properties. And you can keep doing that for a while and things will get smaller and smaller and the rules will stay the same. Eventually, you're going to get to the point where you're looking at atoms. And now, if you cut an atom in half, very explosive things are going to happen. So clearly, between the scale of atoms and the scale of us, the rules have to change. Nanotechnology is about exploring the boundary where the rules are changing from the human scale to the atom scale. And in that area, then all of a sudden, lots of new things come into play, things like quantum mechanics and quantum confinement, local chemistry and structure and thermal fluctuations all start playing a major role and change how any material or object works. The challenge with nanotechnology is if you just take a conventional material and you start cutting it down, as I said, the rules change. And so it actually makes it really difficult to make materials which exit, which uh, uh, that operate the same way on the human scale and the nanoscale. Fortunately, there's lots of materials that naturally exist down at the nanoscale. So we call those nanomaterials. So if you think about a 3D material as any crystal that you normally look at, that would be you know, it, a normal macro scale material. Then we can tend, when we talk about nanomaterials, we tend to talk about dimensionality. So if you take a 2D material, you can think of a sheet or membrane. If you take a 1D material, you can think of a string. If you think of a 0D material, you can think of just a tiny little ball, okay? Whenever we talk about these dimensionalities, really, we don't mean that it's truly two-dimensional. Truly two-dimensional means there's nothing in one direction. What we really mean is that it's so small along that direction that the rules have changed. And that typically that happens on the scale of a few tens of nanometers, okay? So now with using these now, these nanomaterial building blocks, it leads to all sorts of new technologies, new kinds of ways of manipulating energy, 
They, because they're so small, they tend to be very flexible, which leads to new kinds of electronics. They naturally exist on the same scale as molecules and biological processes inside of our cells. So they make great sensors. And you know, there's all sorts of new mechanical systems that we can make as well. I've talked about a bunch of different nanomaterials, but the one that we tend that I love and that we use most in our lab is graphene. And so you may have heard of graphite, probably have heard of graphite, you probably have stabbed yourself with graphite at some point in your uh, uh, classes. Uh, you know, it's what's inside of a pencil. And the reason pencils write so easily is they're made up of, sh of stacked sheets of carbon atoms, where in plane it's a covalently bonded hexagonal lattice. And then out of plane, there's very weak bonds called van der Waals bonds, just holding them together, which allows the layers to sort of slide past each other. What's cool is that actually, there, since there's no bonds holding these layers together, they're actually, they are a stable even as an atomic sheet. And so what we've learned how to do over time is to pull out just one, one sheet of graphene where there's no dangling bonds coming up in the bottom, and now you can isolate that and study that instead of the graphite, which is everything. Here you can actually see, so this is a cartoon of what this graphene looks like, but here you can actually see this is an electron microscopy image, a camera, a picture of these atoms. And you can actually see that hexagonal structure. And so over the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of interest in, these, in this graphene, uh, uh, in graphene. And really, you know, it, it, the, the graphene, this 2D is a 2D sheet and 2D material, but, you know, people have also been studying other forms of this over the last uh, few decades. You know, if you take graphene, the sheet, and roll it up into a tube, then you get a nanotube. If you should roll it up into a ball, you can get a, uh, uh, what they call a buckyball. And of course, if you start stacking them on top of each other, you can get back to the 3D graphite. I have a question actually. Um, yes. So I'm a little bit confused about the 0D, 1D material. So are you like, when it's 0D, are you just looking at a particular atom? No, you're looking at a few atoms. Whenever we talk about a quantum dot, what we mean is it's a collection of atoms where it's only a few atoms in size along all dimensions. And okay. so that, again, that's really confusing because shouldn't 0D mean that there's no size at all? No, what it means is that the electrons inside are feeling squeezed. Because it's so small, the electrons inside are starting to feel squeezed and pushing against each other. Think of it like air inside of a balloon. The electrons inside of a quantum dot, because they're pushing against each other, they, they actually change their properties. Okay? okay. And so, Whenever people use that dimensionality, they don't mean truly nothing there, because that, of course, wouldn't make sense. <laughs> All right. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I did. Yeah, thank you. Great. So, you know, the reason why people are so interested in these materials is because they have really amazing properties. You know, so graphene is, in spite of only being one atom thick and stable as one atom thick, it has some of the, it's one of the highest conductivity materials in the world. It's made out of carbon, which is one of the strongest bonds. Think about diamond. And so it's one of the highest, strongest materials in the world. It's so thin that it's optically transparent. And so you can see through it. And it's because it's just like paper, it's flexible. You can uh, bend and change its shape. And because it's 2D, you can pattern it and use all of the standard lithographic processes we've been using for decades to make things like computer chips and apply it to this new nanomaterial. So it's really easy to work with. It has wonderful properties. And now it's a really big question of how do we take advantage of it? You know, the, just to give you a sense for the level of interest, you know, this material, six years after it was discovered, which really means isolated, the people who managed to do that won the Nobel Prize. I actually, so Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoslov. I actually almost threw up on this guy once at a conference. If you ask real nice, I'll tell you the story about that after the talk is done. So does that mean you wouldn't tell us the story yourself? 
I, I will tell you the story, but not, not while I got science to talk about. <laughs> uh, so uh, the what part of what made this process and this field so exciting is how easy it is to actually access and get into it. Basically, these guys who won the Nobel Prize, they were able to isolate this material using scotch tape, where what they did is they just took the graphite and put, put it between two sticky things. And then they peeled it apart. The graphite cleaves in half. You peel it apart again, the graphite cleaves in half again, and again and again. You've done Taylor series. You, you probably have seen very quickly, you can go, the thickness will go down to very thin. And then they just took that and they rubbed it on the surface of a uh, silicon oxide chip. And while you get all sorts of thicknesses on the surface of the chip, every once in a while, you'll get a picture like the one down here where you can actually see the graphene. So here, that's one layer graphene. The slightly darker is two layers. The slightly darker is three layers and four. And then over here on the right, that really bright thing, that's actually thick graphite. And then you can actually wire it up and now you can build circuits out of this material. And in the last 20 years, people have gotten super excited about studying this material and using it in all sorts of applications. You know, basically anywhere that you have electronics or anywhere that you have mechanical systems or composites, people are trying to use this material for those applications. As a few examples, because it's transparent and conductive, people are trying to make flexible touch screens out of it, because uh, our graphene speakers, uh, because it's very thin, they're trying to make DNA sequencers where you poke a hole and you can feed DNA through and measure the, the, what the DNA is. So it gives you a new way of trying to uh, uh, sequence DNA. Or, you know, some of my old work is to make little mechanical resonators out of it, which you can use for things like signal processing in your, like when you want to measure RF signals in your cell phone. You can take these and make foams out of them, which may lead to ultralight foams that are also very compressible. And then you can, uh, uh, because the electronic properties are, are very, uh, good and because it's all surface, you can make really nice sensors out of it by just measuring changes in conductivity when you put molecules on it. And, you know, people are trying to figure out not just the sort of simple ways of exfoliation, but new methods for trying to make ink made out of this material. What makes this, this field even more exciting is there's not just one material, there's actually many. So there's lots of other structures that have this same materials that have the same sort of layered structure. So here I show molybdenum disulfide, where instead of a sheet of carbon, it's made of a sheet of molybdenum and sulfur atoms. And, but you know, there are many, many others. Um, each of them share that common property of just having in-plane strong bonds and out-of-plane weak bonds, which means that they can be isolated. When you look at these materials, basically every property that you could possibly want in material science exists somewhere in this family. Everything from sort of standard electronics, metals, insulators, semiconductors, to exotic properties like superconductivity or magnetism or quantum confinement all exist somewhere in this family. And you know, that means that, so for example, if we just think about semiconductors, that's the basis of all optoelectronics, you know, everything from you know, your cell phone screens to, uh, 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 to um, fiber optic networks. If you can have new kinds of semiconductors, they can be useful in all sorts of applications, which are about signal processing or sensing or emitting light. Even more, since we have all of these individual materials, each one is stable as a monolayer. But what we can do now is we can actually stack one on top of the other. You can think of it as like leg nanoscale Legos, where we're just taking each piece and stacking it on top, and we can build heterostructures. What's cool is that these heterostructures, if you stack them in the, just the right order, you can actually engineer all of the electronics that we use in, 
but now you can have everything be at the scale of one or two atoms thick. And so you can actually build atomic scale circuitry by layering these materials in just the right way. So, so now, does that mean there's like very little interference between the layers because of those weak layer bonds? Yeah. And so, so normally the biggest challenge in sort of conventional material electronics is not making a single material, it's how do you interface materials together? Because you get lots of defects at those interfaces. Here, there's no bond. And so you can just stack things on top of the other and it'll actually still work. Amazingly, it'll still work. That shouldn't be obvious, but it does. <laughs> um, okay. So, you know, how do we, let me show you one way that we make these heterostructures, because that's not at all obvious. Usually, what the first thing that we do is first we need monolayers to stack. So we'll do that exfoliation process where we'll isolate those monolayers from each other. And then we'll take them and we'll put them on something sticky but dissolve, but but uh, dissolvable. And we'll just we'll actually take one of the materials and under a microscope looking at them, we will stack it and touch the two materials together. They're just a little bit stickier to each other than they are to the surface that they're on. So when you touch them together, they stick and you pick them up and now you have two layers that are on one surface. And then you go and you repeat and you can get three layers, and then repeat and four layers and on and on and on. So we can now- um, I have a question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, great. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm wondering how the material doesn't get stuck to that original thing you're like placing it on. So, so it's because it's on something that's stickier. So, you know, imagine this. Have you ever picked up breadcrumbs off of a table, like after dinner and you're kind of still a little snacky? You take your finger and you go push it down and you pick up the breadcrumb. Well, the breadcrumb stuck to the table, not very well, but it's stickier to your finger. So when you push the, them two, two together, it'll get stuck on your finger, right? It's basically the same idea. We just moderate the adhesions in just the right way. And so we can make it stick, we can tell it when to stick to one surface or the other. We can play tricks like vary the temperature and a lot of materials get more or less sticky as you increase or decrease the temperature. And so if you choose two materials where one will get stickier and one will get less sticky and increase the temperature, then you can ch change which surface something wants to stick to. How would you exactly increase the temperature? Like, would you just change the room temperature? Or is there like a certain device or machine? Uh, well, let me ask you this. When you're cooking, do you, do you just heat up the kitchen? No. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. I, I, I didn't mean to uh, <laughs> uh, give you a hard time there. We, we just use, we have little tiny hot plates and we can have that are, you know, about yay big. And so we can put the, our chips onto those hot plates. And so we can locally heat things up. Cool. Uh, great questions. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, everything I've been talking about has been little tiny exfoliated materials. And you may be asking yourself, well, what the heck is, how is this useful for technology? And of course, you know, little exfoliated things are not, but we've been spent, since we've been interested in this, we've spent the last few uh, uh, years figuring out scalable methods for growing these materials. So we're at the point now where we can grow things like graphene by the meter, and we can grow other materials like MOS2, not as well. We can grow it at sort of wafer scales, but what that means is that now we can actually think about it as a technology as opposed to a scientific curiosity. So whenever you're, in, during my talk, you'll see me going back and forth between these exfoliation techniques and the CVD techniques. And which one I choose really has to do with whether we're aiming for an application or whether we're aiming for fundamental science and you know, where we're at with each material in that sort of spectrum of process. Okay, so up until now, I've been talking about 2D materials as sort of electronic objects. But if you think about it, you know, if I take this material and I isolate it, it's a membrane. And as a membrane, it's now can be floppy and sort of three-dimensional. And so 
these 2D materials are not just the ultimate limit of a molecular electronic material, they're also the ultimate limit of a mechanical atomic membrane. And that sort of key idea, those, both of those capabilities is really the core piece of the IRG2 of this MRSAC, uh, the, the, the thing that sort of drives a lot of the research. And so before I get into telling you what I think you can do with these things, I think it's a really good exercise. Everybody take a moment and think about, maybe grab a piece of paper and think about what, could, what can you do with a membrane that is only one atom thick? A good place to start is what can you do with a piece of paper that you can't do, let's say, with a, uh, a plate, <laughs> okay? So can anybody give me some suggestions of things that I can do with this piece of paper? I guess you could like slide it into like very thin places. Yeah, so we can slip it into small spots. That's a great idea. What else? Any other ideas? The only thing that you can do with a sheet of paper, slip it into things. You can fold it or wrap it around something else or yeah. you know, write, write on it. It's a 3D object, right? <laughs> Someone in the chat says fold it into a swan or a paper airplane. <laughs> exactly. So that's origami, right? So of course, you know, with the 3D object, we can bend and flex it in all sorts of different ways. So absolutely. We can also do other things, you know? So as you mentioned, we can write on it. I would call that patterning. We can also do things like tear it, right? And tearing is also a form of patterning because now it's changed the properties. But wouldn't a tear be like defeating the purpose of a membrane? It depends on what you want to use the membrane for. If you want to use it to seal different spaces away from each other, then yeah. But I'll show you in a minute, or, uh, in a few minutes, an example where you might want it to be not necessarily torn, but cut, right? So tearing, bad, cutting, good. <laughs> uh, so, you know, these are just a few examples for paper. And so as I'm talking to you guys, what I want you guys to sort of think about is how is a 2D material different from paper? And so, you know, how is 2D material different from, let's say, paper, or in what ways is it actually the same? You know, and that's, of course, that's the, always the question we have in nanotechnology. How are, how are things, act, the rules different, and how are the rules the same? Because sometimes they're a little bit of one, and sometimes they're a little bit of the other. Then, once we know what the rules are, and what the new rules are, can we do can we just use that, those properties to make something that is slightly better than something that already exists? Or if the rules are different, maybe we can make something that just does not exist. Okay, so why do we care about this mechanic stuff and in electronics? Well, it really comes down to where we are in this, as a society with electronics. Right now, we're at a point where silicon-based electronics computers are really good. They can do billions of calculations per second. You can have billion, billions of transistors on a single chip. But for the most part, all of them are really hard, stiff objects. And so where we are trying to go in terms of future technologies is now to have electronics that rather than being stiff, hard objects, they are deformable, where things that you can have laminated over a three-dimensional form factor or, you know, wear on your body and into contact with your skin or, you know, a, a cell phone, which you can fold up or scroll up, for example, as just a few examples. Is the new Samsung phone that can like fold, is that kind of an example of? Exactly, exactly. And that, what they'll tell you is it kind of works, but not very well yet. <laughs> like they, they can make a single fold as opposed to let's say the entire object is sort of bendable. But that's already a major success and uh, exactly along those lines. And actually, you know, 
these ideas of deformable electronics, in many ways, the, this is a material science problem. If we want to have deformable electronics, we need deformable materials. And so here's where these 2D materials can help out. Because actually, a lot of the conventional materials, like silicon that we use, are very stiff and very brittle. Because 2D materials are atomically thin, just like a piece of paper, they become very bendable. Okay? You know, if I take this book, I can hold it in my hands and it doesn't move anywhere. This is the same material as the book, and yet it's very flexible. Simple as that. It's just scaling. And at the same time, as I showed you, they have great electronic properties. So they make a really good candidate for these deformable electronic systems. Can you go back to the chart? Where it says like bulk and organic, what are those kinds of classifications? Yeah, so, so those are different. What I have plotted there, right now my, my view chat is covering the plot, so I can't actually see exactly what it says while talking to you. Um, Though you can think of those as sort of classical uh, classes of materials. So typically what people are trying to use for deformable electronics are things like nanowires and nanomembranes made out of classical materials or organic electronics made out of things like, like molecules, okay? And so, but what we see is organic electronics they can be a lot less stiff than these bulk materials, but their electronic properties are terrible. Whereas nanowires and nanomembranes, because they're just thicker structures, they tend to be a lot stiffer, although they're electrically just about as good as these 2D materials. That's what this plot is saying. Mobility is just a term that we use for measuring the quality of electronic performance in a material. Okay, so what we're doing in this MERSEC is we're thinking about, hey, what are all the different ways that we can pattern or, or deform these nano, nanomembranes and how do we take advantage of that to engineer new bendable or flexible systems or create new quantum properties? I think you guys heard from Nadia Mason last week about you know, quantum mechanics, you know, like quantum transport and probably these materials. We are more on the mechanics side. How do we understand the mechanics of the membranes? What kind of deform, you know, how do 3D deformations or these weird van der Waals interfaces affect the properties? So here's a nice little movie. If I can... There we go. Here, this is an optical movie. On the right, we can see graphene. On the left, you can see a little micro needle that we push down and are pushing on the graphene. And you can actually see the graphene is just folding up, just like you would expect for kind of a, a, a piece of saran wrap or a membrane. And then as you pull the membrane, the needle back, you can see the, the membrane flatten out again. So this is really showing how much we can deform these structures by taking advantage of this. So these are just sort of continuous sheets. But now here you can do things like pattern the graphene into what we call kirigami, which are sort of a pattern series of cuts. Uh, and here it's a, they're taking the gra that graphene, stretchable graphene electrode made out of kirigami and laminating it over a cell, uh, a, a brain cell. And when you, or a nerve cell, excuse me. Uh, and by measuring the transport through the graphene when it's in contact with the cell, down on the bottom right, you can actually measure and see changes in potential. Those are the pulses and changes in potential going through the cell, that the nerve cell as it operates. And so we can use these as very deformable, conformable sensors. So, you know, th that just gives you sort of a flavor of some of the things that are possible with these materials. And let me, you know, but, you know, up until now, I've just sort of been saying, oh, they're super deformable. One simple question that we wanted to answer is exactly how deformable are they? So we wanted to measure the stiffness of a sheet that is only one atom thick. You'd think that 
that's something that is not that hard to do. But actually, it turns out people have been trying for the last 10 years and failing. And the way that we know that they're failing is that people are measuring get values that are orders of magnitude off from each other. You know, like they, they're saying that it's like saying a piece of paper has the same stiffness as a brick. And, um, and so they're measuring different values that are orders of magnitude off from each other and that even have different scaling laws. And so clearly, even though people were trying, they weren't able to really resolve and understand where, what the mechanics of these membranes were. So in order to actually do it, what we realized is we had to go all the way down to the nanoscale. Because if you want to understand the mechanics of something that's very small, you have to look at very small scales. So what we realized is if we want to measure the mechanics of these materials, we had to look at how they deform under a well-controlled system. If you guys have, you know, if there are any mechanical engineers in the audience, you'll recognize this. If you want to measure the mechanical stiffness of any object, the way that you do it is you apply a known force and you measure the shape, change in shape. We're doing that same idea except on the atomic scale. The way we do it is by taking graphene and laminating it over atomic steps in another 2D material called hexagonal boron nitride. And what happens is, the, as I told you, the materials like to stick to each other. So the force of adhesion pulls the graphene down, and then the force of bending pulls it up. And what you end up getting is a balance of a shape of the, uh, uh, that tells you what the mechanical stiffness is. So another question that is reasonable is how the heck do we actually see structures that are so darn small? So we actually have, you know, in nanotechnology, we have all sorts of techniques that allow us to image very small things. It's important that we be able to do this because otherwise, how the heck would we know what we're making? So one of these techniques is scanning transmission electron microscopy. The idea is an electron is very small right? It, you know, it goes inside of an atom. It is. <laughs> and so you can actually shoot electrons at a material and look at how they scatter. And you can build an image of the uh, material by looking at how the electrons scatter. So that, that image that I showed you earlier of graphene, that is taken by using transmission electron microscopy. And we can actually see the shape of the, this lattice. But now a bend is actually on the side. So what we, if we want to take an image of that, we can't look at it from the top. So in order to make these bends, what we did is we took graphite, few layer graphite or monolayer graphene, and we stuck it over the HBN steps. So here in this optical image, you can actually see these, this pink color is uh, just a flat surface. And as we see these changes in color, those represent changes in thickness. So wherever you have a change in color, there's gonna be a little step. Then we take a, what we call focused ion beam and we cut into this structure and cut out a cross section. And now here you can actually see the cross section looking at it from the side. There's our substrate. And there you can see all these little tiny atomic scale steps. Bup, 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 bup. We zoom in on one of those steps, we can now measure and see the lamination. Here we have three layer graphene laminated over a one, la one atomic layer uh, uh, step. And you can see that there's a slight curve to the graphene. So now what we do is we look at the bending and adhesion energies and we build a little equation that says that you, by considering these two factors, we can extract the bending stiffness and by just looking at the shape of the bend. So we can extract, we look at the radius of curvature of the bend and how much it's bending by and the height of the step, and thereby we can extract this bending stiffness. So the first thing we wanted to know is what is the stiffness of a single layer of atoms? And what we found, you know, if you go back in the literature, again, people have been trying for a while, but then if you look at the values that people get from theory, they predict values that are quite small. But then when people try to measure experiments, look at these scale bar, look at the error bars on this first 
for one thing. First, it's much, it's quite big. Second, error bars are ridiculous. It could be anything. Um, they were just not. They were not getting the same numbers, and the num and the numbers were all over the place. So when we measured it using our technique, the steps, what we got were very tiny values that actually matched very nicely to the predictions. And so we were actually able to directly measure the bending stiffness of this graphene and have it met, meet with predictions. Monolayer graphene is easy. We, we un actually had a pretty good idea of what to expect for it. What is less obvious is how, how when you have a multi-layer stack, how do these layers interact and how does that affect the bending stiffness? So to study that, we changed the number of layers in the graphene and we changed step height and we just measured many, many different devices. And what we found, so here on the right is a plot of this bending stiffness versus the number of graphene layers. What we found, all those black points are the measured values. There are two, I have two models built on here. The blue line is what you would expect from classical continuum mechanics. The red line is a model where you would expect that the layers do not interact at all. The difference between these two, that blue line would be equivalent to having a book, right? Where if you try to bend it, it's super stiff. And that's because the layers are interacting and so uh, stiffness go, uh, gets transmitted between the layers. However, what if the layers are allowed to slip with respect to each other? So now if I bend this much thicker stack of paper, what I find is that I can bend it really easily. And what you see is along the right-hand side, maybe it's your left-hand side, the reason why it's bending really easily is the bottom layers are slipping and going out with respect to the top layers. And so what this data tells us is actually graphene behaves a lot more like a stack of papers than it behaves like a book, where all the, the values that we get are very close to that slip limit, okay? But we did see something weird, where if you look at this data, you know, it actually, the, it doesn't sit on this line, right? It sits above the line, and there's a lot of what looks like variations. What we realized when we plotted the data more carefully is that if we color coded our data by how much we bent it, actually the value varies. When we bend it by a small angle, it's stiffer. And then as you keep on bending, the material actually gets softer and softer. So at higher bending angles, it's a softer material than at, at low bending angles. This was a little bit confusing but it actually starts to make sense when you remember that this material is based on atoms. And so as a result, when you're bending it, first the atoms are all locked together, they're lined up. And then as you bend it further, then the atoms stop lining up and now they can slide much more freely. And that leads to a bending angle dependence. Once we had this idea, we could actually use simulations to actually prove it. So here we have a simulation of the stiffness versus the bending angle for monolayer, two layer, three layer, four layer, five layer. What you see is for small bending angles, the mechanics are dominated by shear where the layers interact and it goes up really quickly. At large bending angles, it says the layers can slip past each other perfectly freely and you it, it, everything flattens out. And so basically, again, what this tells us is that the mechanics of graphene are much more like the mechanics of a piece of, uh, 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 of a, a, a stack of papers than a piece of wood, even though the, the material, you know, even, uh, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm, because I'm going a little bit slower, I'm gonna skip over a couple of things. Uh, what, where am I at with time? I don't have my clock on my screen. It's currently 12.43. Okay, so I think, uh, uh, let me try to wrap this up in an, uh, another five minutes. So I'm gonna skip over one topic and show you one way that we can use these materials, this idea of slip. And so, you know, 
what, what I just showed you was what I would call a very fundamental mechanics study. Can we understand exactly how these materials move at atomic length scales? Now we can use that idea of slip and build a device which takes advantage of it. And so the idea here is if we want to make a stretchable electronics which takes advantage of it. And so the idea here is if we want to make a stretchable electronics, now we have to think about not just how you, a freestanding membrane, we have to think about how the membrane interacts with the surface. So if you take any surface and make some different property on the surface and try to bend it or flex it, you're going to end up with wrinkles. So here we see a bunch of different uh, types of wrinkles that you get when you compress thin films. This is something that happens in all kinds of places in nature, right? Anything from how a, pun a pumpkin's shape evolves to, you know, to how our brains get all these little crinkles in them. All of that happens as a result of a of having a material on one surface, which has a slightly different property than the underlying surface, and then creating deformations. You can even create wrinkles for yourself right now if you just take your arm and uh, give it a little compression. And so if we wanna think about making devices, we have to think about how the 2D material interacts with the substrate that it's on. And basically what we've learned over time is that a 2D material, if you don't it stick it strongly onto the substrate and you produce compressions, you'll, it'll delaminate from the surface, which makes all these sort of wrinkle crumple features. This, so, you know, to get a sense for what this looks like, here we have a couple of uh, uh, electron microscopy images. So if we take graphene on a surface and, and apply uniaxial compression, we get all these wrinkles along one direction. If we apply biaxial compression, just like if you take a piece of paper and crumple it up, then it, uh, uh, you get these uh, fractal structure. So you might be asking, well, why the heck did, are we crumpling these, this material up? And the reason is if we wanna make stretchable electronics, we need a stretchable material. If you take a flat piece of paper and we stretch it, even by a couple of percent, it's gonna tear. If we take something and first crumple it up, now without breaking it, we can stretch and unstretch it by a few hundred percent and it's not breaking. So this is, gives us a way of making stretchable systems. You can actually see this on the right. So here we have crumpled graphene and then we can now stretch it along one direction or the other. And you can see that it's getting longer, wider or narrower. It's just the middle region, um, but it's not cracking. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this idea that we can make heterostructure electronic devices by layering materials on top of each other and combine it with this idea of crumpling. What can we make a device where it can crumple and yet still work? So the way we do this, so here's an example. We take graphene and we pattern the graphene into little squares, at which we use as electrodes. And this triangle is CVD grown molybdenum disulfide. So you see graphene, MOS2 graphene in this picture. Basically the graphene is acting as an electrode and the MOS2 is acting as a semiconducting channel. If you know your electrical engineering, then what you'll see is that the, this structure is like a photodetector. It is a photodetector geometry. And so what we can do is we can shine a laser on it and see how well does it work as a photodetector. So here we have another one of these devices, again, graphene electrodes and the 2D material in between. And if we shot here, we have conductivity versus time. What we're doing is we start with the light off and you can see that there's no conductivity. Then we shine light on it and it turns on. It's detecting the light. Hey, it works. We turn it off and on and off and on and you can see the, light the, the current through the device switching on and off. These two plots on the right, we just change things like how much laser power we have or how much brain bias we apply to just see what the device properties are. 
what we learn from all of these measurements is that at low power, the device is reached with photoresponsivities of a, what we call of 20 amps per watt. That number probably doesn't mean a lot to you guys, but it's actually really impressive. It's about a hundred times better than a silicon photosensor. You know, things that people have meant, spent decades engineering. Our first time with one of these devices, we're already getting something that's a hundred times better. Okay. And then moreover, it's stretchable. So here, what we're seeing, we're we use a special technique by, called scanning photocurrent microscopy. We can measure where is the photosensitive region of the device. So on the left, we can see that in this map, we're seeing that the photosensitive region is, is in this MOS2 between the graphene electrodes. And now as we stretch it, we can stretch it along one direction or the other, the intensity of the, uh, of the responsivity is changing, but we can still see it's lighting up just a little bit inside of the channel, even when we stretch it by a lot. This tells us that the device still functions. And it's still, even when we stretch it by 200%, it's still maintaining its functionality. This means that we are now have a new way of creating stretchable and yet high performance electronic systems. And so the reason why this works is first, because each individual material is super thin. And second, because when we stack the layers on top of each other, they can slide a little bit to relieve the strain. And thereby, even under these big deformations, they still will, uh, the, they will relax the strain and, and still be able to function. OK. I'm probably out of time, so I'm just gonna skip over everything else and go to my summary. Basically, what I've talked about today is how we can take 2D materials, which have all these wonderful electronic and mechanical properties, and we can take, take advantage of the unique mechanics to create new classes of nanoelectromechanical systems and material properties, which are stretchable and tunable and deformable. And moreover, Understanding the interface is critical to understanding the performance of these devices and structures. So with that, I think I will stop and see, do you guys have any questions? Where was the memory that was supposed to be like okay to cut? Yeah, it might not have been obvious. Let me go back a few dozen slides. So if we go back to here, this image, take a look oh, at okay. the membrane. Do you notice that it doesn't look like a continuous membrane? It has a big series of cuts in it. And each of those cuts when you have them, it allows the structure to become stretchable because now when you pull on the ends, now the cuts, the holes get bigger and the material deforms out of plane rather than the material tearing. Okay. I, you're right. I should have a little cartoon of what, is, what does the structure actually look like to make that a little more obvious. I mean, isn't it supposed to kind of look like a lattice from like a really old school uh, elevator or window? The ones that like, uh, it's like a shutter? Um, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that. I mean, if I'm thinking like there's gratings and, you know, gratings are a good way to make a, a stable structure visible and they, they also have little cuts in them. Is that what you mean? Well, you know, in those really older building uh, elevators that when the elevator door opens, you also have to open that grate? Sure. Yeah. So, so in those, they often have, in, in those, it's typically um, joints and mechanisms. So it's much more classical mechanical engineering. This is a, what I would call a compliant structure. So in a, in a mechanism, you can have, you know, like a, a ball and socket where things are allowed to rotate. In a compliant structure, things have to change their shape. So in traditional mechanical engineering, you'll see lots of mechanisms where you have stiff structures with flexible, with uh, 
uh, movable joints between them. And I think that in what you're thinking of, that would be an example more of that classical mechanical engineering stuff. But the, there is a lot of people right now who are trying to do the, this idea that we're talking about at the nanoscale, compliant structures, and do engineering at every length scale, from folding satellites to uh, 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 you know, 3D printable tweezers or pliers. It's all kind of the same idea. All right, I see another question from Ross. You want to ask your question? Yeah, so um, when I saw that uh, slide that you had about some of the applications of, of um, these 2D materials, um, I saw a slide on, or I saw a picture of, uh, I think, suggesting things about transistors. And I was curious if, to your knowledge, anybody had tried making like a CPU, for example, out of, uh, out of graphene. Uh, yes. Uh, so there's a lot of effort in that. <laughs> uh, as you yeah. might expect, computer companies are willing to put a little, a lot of money into thing structures that can be a lot smaller. Mm. Pure graphene does not have a band gap. So something that you need uh, intrinsically need to make a computer chip is a material with a band gap. Right. So just graphene by itself, you can't make a computer chip. However, with these other 2D materials like MOS2, for example, that is a semiconductor. So with this idea of heterostructures, we can absolutely think about making computer chips, like individual devices. And right now there's a lot of effort going into this step right here. How do we go from these individual device concepts to integrated circuitry? which is of course what you need for a CPU. Mm -hmm. People have not yet succeeded with it with 2D materials. People have demonstrated, hey, I can make 10 million devices, but they haven't made a computer out of it at this stage. Interesting, thanks. Yeah. Sure. Any other questions? I guess I'm kind of curious about um, how you exactly got to do kind of this kind of research from like, so I'm assuming you didn't do this kind of research in grad school and such. I, I actually did. Um, so I, I kind of fell into it by accident. So in graduate school, my first, my first project was studying carbon nanotube uh, uh, devices because now these 2D materials are really popular, but before the 2D materials were popular, people were trying to do a lot of the same stuff with carbon nanotubes. Turns out it's a heck of a lot harder to make something ordered out of spaghetti than with a piece of paper. Um, so what I was studying is how do we make nanomechanical resonators, imagine a violin guitar string or a guitar string using a carbon nanotube. And so I was studying the mechanic, like building these mechanical resonators. Is that like a 1D material then? That is a 1D material, exactly. So ima it, imagine a, a string made out of carbon atoms, okay? And so I was studying the mechanics. And then actually there was a person in the next lab over from me trying to make transistors using the graphene, the electronic stuff, and one day he came to me and he said, by, he, by accident, he had been doing this exfoliation process that I showed you, by accident, he had accidentally made a sheet go across a little trench in the chip. And he was just like, hey, this is weird. What is, what's going on here? And we looked at it together and we were like, we can, we can suspend these things? Nobody knew that before well, what can we do with that? <laughs> and that has been the rest of my career. <laughs> and so because I had been already, I had been primed in the sense of I was already studying mechanical structures, mechanical systems from other nanomaterials, it immediately made it work for, you know, I immediately knew what to do and I had the skills. This is something that I think researchers often forget. 
is there's a difference between what you're studying and the skills that you're developing. A PhD is about, and research is about developing skills. In order to develop skills, you have to do it on something, <laughs> right? But often, you know, I see people leaving a lab will be like, I know how to make a, a, a 2D transistor. And I'm just like, no, what you understand is how to do nanofabrication, nano characterization, material synthesis, and electronic measurements. Those are the skills, and they are translatable. They could be applied to any system once you know how to do them. So what one thing that you guys should hopefully be getting out of these REUs is a set of nice research skills. And really think about that as you're thinking about what you want to do next. And if somebody says, what do you know how to do? Think about the skill, not the thing that you did it on. Sorry, that went off on a tangent. <laughs> uh, no, it was actually really fascinating to hear about, so thank you. Good, I'm glad. All right, well, if there are no more questions, then I will thank you for your attention.